Greetings and welcome back, everybody. I hope you gathered your blueprints, found your fake mustaches, and put on your gloves, because today we are talking about a heist, specifically the Isabella Stewart Gardner Art Museum heist. This is a robbery, the world's biggest art heist, is a limited series that just released on Netflix, and it tells the story around 13 pieces of historic art that were stolen in Boston, Massachusetts. I can't wait to get into details, so let's get into it. This is Red Eye Reviews. Now, as with my other videos on Netflix documentaries, I will be going over everything. So there will be plenty of spoilers, but it is a very complex plot and there are a lot of players. So I'm gonna do my best to explain it all, but I won't be able to talk about every detail. So I hope there'll be plenty of incentive to go and watch the series yourself. Our story starts in Boston, Massachusetts on the day of the St. Patrick's Day Parade, Sunday, March 18th, 1990. The museum director goes to open the Isabella Stewart Gardner Art Museum for the day, and when attempting to buzz into the building, doesn't receive a response from security. She calls the head of security, and the two enter the building to discover several painting frames where the pieces were cut out, as well as several other missing items, and broken doors, and other things. And our two security guards are nowhere to be found. Now before we go on, let's talk about the history of this museum, and who Isabella Stewart Gardner was. Well, she was a millionaire bohemian from New York who spent a fair portion of her life traveling the world. And when she went to Harvard, she fell in love with art, and a long story short, built herself a museum where she could display her collection to the public. This collection consists of works by Raphael, Matisse, Manet, Rembrandt, and many others. The building itself is a piece of art, and each room is carefully curated and themed. And when she actually went to test the acoustics of the building before its grand opening, she brought in students from the School of the Blind to listen to music so they could test the acoustics but be unable to see inside the museum before she was actually ready. Now in her final notes, she asked that if anything had to be permanently altered, or the building were to come under some sort of major construction, that all the pieces of art were to be shipped to Paris and auctioned off, and that money donated to the School of Harvard. So because of this, the building itself has not changed since its construction in 1898. But back to 1990, our security guards have been discovered, found in the basement tunnels, handcuffed and duct taped. And while finding them alive was wonderful, it raised a lot of questions. Why were they not killed? Because you see, this is Boston, and at this time it was a boiling pot of Italian and Irish mobsters, a lot of organized crime, and an out-of-control cocaine business and firearms underground to boot. So if this was a professional robbery, which it appeared to be so, why wouldn't they kill these guards? Dead men tell no tales, it's simpler. And this starts a long line of questioning and clues that they would soon follow. Now the 13 pieces stolen were various paintings, sketches, a vase, a bronze finial, but most importantly was a Vermeer, which Vermeer is mostly known for his painting of the girl with the pearl earring, but it's important to note that he only created 33 or so paintings in his lifetime, so this was a major loss. But arguably even more devastating was the loss of a piece called the Storm of the Sea of Galilee, the only known seascape painting to have ever been created by Rembrandt. So with all of this totaled, we come up to roughly $200 million worth of art that was stolen. What makes this worse is most police departments don't have an arts crime department, especially not in the early 90s, so they had no idea how to handle the crime scene. They called the FBI to help with the case, but before they arrived, the local police had been in and out of the museum a dozen times, and this was before they were even required to keep records of who goes in and out of a crime scene. So they were touching evidence, moving things, opening and closing doors. So even if you wanted to collect DNA or fingerprints, well, for one, that technology was very new for the early 90s, but two, everything was already contaminated at this point. Their only hope for fingerprints was on the duct tape used to bound the two security guards, but it got thrown away and it never resurfaced. So their hopes for an easy identification was already out the window before they even started. Now, per the FBI's recommendation, the museum put out a $1 million reward for information leading to these paintings. And as you can guess, that basically broke their phone system but it did lead to two people coming forward as eyewitnesses the night before, claiming to have seen what looked like two police officers sitting in a car just outside the museum. Now, the primary questioning for the incident fell on the security guards, obviously, and mainly on Richard Abbott, the one who let these people in. Because this heist not only looked planned, but it looked like they had inside information, even. Not to mention the fact that they were just let in to begin with. 
And Richard, when questioned, he said the men were dressed like police officers and they asked to be let in to investigate a disturbance. So he buzzed them into the holding room, which is like a room with two doors and the security window, basically a precaution so that if somebody in that room looks suspicious, he can just hold them in there while the cops arrive. However, these men appeared to be the cops. Not only that, but they claimed to have a warrant for Richard's arrest. So he buzzed them through the second door, they gathered him and the other security guard, handcuffed them both, and then proceeded to inform them they were being robbed. Now the reason that doesn't exonerate Richard right there is because of the amount of knowledge the thieves had. They knew where the most priceless pieces of art were. They knew where the security system was and the tapes that were being recorded. They knew the motion sensor machine had a printout of activity, so they took the script. But the main reason the FBI felt it could have been an inside job is because the thieves stayed inside for 81 minutes. This means they felt comfortable enough to take their time. At one point, they even tripped a proximity sensor and just continued to work, as if they knew the police weren't even being called. But why were they so calm? And why didn't Richard push the panic button and inform the police? Now, obviously, this makes Richard look extremely bad, especially given the fact he even opened the outside door roughly 10 minutes before the thieves entered, which some speculated could have maybe been a sign to the thieves or some sort of signal, as opening a security door is definitely not part of the protocol. Despite all of this, Richard cannot be formally charged with anything because they had no evidence he was an accomplice, especially when other security guards came forward and talked about the security being poor to begin with. The sensors were buggy, the building itself has issues being so old, and the fact that Richard was a major druggie and would frequently show up to work high, so he was probably just bad at his job. And several other things beyond that helped Richard's case, so he was ultimately let go. So now if it wasn't an inside job, and it was clearly planned and executed by professionals, that leads us back to the Irish or Italian mob, or possibly something to do with drugs. Because as I mentioned, Boston had a big issue with cocaine at the time. So let's say you want to buy a boat, but you can't afford it. Well, you take a loan out from the bank and you put your house up as collateral. Makes sense. Well, now how do you do that in the black market? Let's say I want to purchase a large quantity of cocaine, but I don't have the money to do so. Well, you put something else down as collateral. For instance, stolen art, which was used on many occasions. It was basically treated as a 10% of its value. So $200 million of stolen Rembrandts and Manets could be used for around $20 million of collateral in the black market. So using that as a theory, the FBI investigated further into the mobs. Now initially they went after the Irish mob. However, during this time tensions in Ireland were already extremely high between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and when questions, members of the IRA, the Irish Republic Army, said that we're far too busy fighting our own civil war to care about a handful of fancy paintings. Rest assured, the IRA did not do this. Which doesn't exonerate them, but it does lead the FBI down other avenues in the meantime. And they chose to thoroughly investigate our final lead, the Italian mob. And this is where the story gets very interesting but very complex. I will do my best to explain this all, hopefully we don't get lost. But before I get too deep into this, I need to tell you about a notorious art thief named Miles Connor. He is regarded as one of the most infamous art thieves in the country, maybe the world. With over 30 heists that he admits to, and hundreds if not thousands of pieces of historical art stolen or sold or collected himself even, he's kind of a big deal. Now you might be wondering how someone like that is walking around free today and talking to Netflix for this documentary. Well, he did several stays in various prisons, but he discovered a very powerful bargaining chip, historic art. Because you see, when you go to jail for burglary or petty crime, you deal with local police. But if you're involved in historic pieces of art or documents, and those things are still missing, you deal with the FBI. And the FBI has the power to make deals with criminals for their cooperation. Which is how you get things like informants or people wearing wires and things. So the FBI will give them a lighter sentence if they can provide them a bigger fish to fry or some kind of sweet reward. So Miles Connor was great at this because he had a lot of stolen art. So if he went to jail, he would say, hey, if you let me go, I'll tell you where you can find a lost Monet. And boom, his sentence would get reduced or sometimes even dropped. But now speaking of the FBI, their primary focus in Boston at this time was the Italian mob. And in the 90s, they cracked down hard, arresting members left and right, gaining informants, and crippling the mob's income. Which this caused tension in the mob, and it started to fall apart from within. Most notably, a side gang was created, led by Vinny Ferraro, who wanted to take control, but his past got up to him, and he gets caught by the feds as well. Well, one of Ferraro's men, named Bobby Donati, was close friends with Miles Connor, and knew the power stolen art could have when attempting to make a deal with the feds. So it isn't a big leap to make that Donati could have put together the Gardner Museum heist to get some sort of bargaining chip to free Ferraro from prison. 
However, the FBI couldn't bring Donati in for questioning because days after this heist, he was found dead, having been brutally murdered. And while his murder was never solved, during the investigation, they did find two police uniforms in his property, which provides even more legitimacy to the Gardner Museum heist. And at this point, the actual trail of evidence starts to grow cold for years. And the museum wanted to raise more attention to the case, so our $1 million reward has now become $5 million at this point, to put this theft back into the public eye. Meanwhile, the Boston Herald wanted to help shed more light on this case, and they began investigating more into Donati. They learned that he was friends with Miles Connor, who during the time of this robbery, he was in prison, so there was no way Miles could have done this. But when they called Miles in prison, he claimed to have a trailer where he would store his art collection, and Donati knew about that trailer, so it's possible if he did steal these paintings, he could have hidden them there. So the Herald investigator goes to check the trailer out, and he learns the property's caretaker, William Youngsworth, was going behind Miles' back and selling off his art for his own profit. So there is a chance he could have just sold these without even realizing. However, Youngsworth also has ties to organized crime, and he also currently was going to court for a slew of crimes that would put him away for a very long time. So he wised up, and he told them that he knew where the Gardner paintings were, but would only give them up if he could walk free from prison. The journalist from the Herald offered to help Youngsworth out if he would just show him the paintings and provide legitimacy to his claims. However, this being his only bargaining chip, he was very careful and only showed him one painting in a dark warehouse. And the journalist claims that it was The Storm on the Sea of Galilee by Rembrandt. However, he couldn't say for sure. So he asked Youngsworth if he could send some pictures of the arts or maybe some paint chips, things like that, that they could help verify the legitimacy of his case. And Youngsworth sent him just enough evidence to keep them kind of strung along, but not enough to prove that he really had the paintings. And to top it off at this point, the museum is practically begging the FBI to just give Miles and Youngsworth full immunity, because if they do have the paintings, they just want them back. However, the FBI refused this, and Youngsworth goes to jail, and the trail starts to go cold again. Now, with even more time passing and nothing going on, the museum has increased the reward to $10 million. And during this time, Miles Connor becomes even more cooperative. And while never saying he had anything to do with it, because he was obviously in prison, he said if Bobby Donati were to do something like this, he would have done it with his best friend Garinti, who's another mobster. Who would have thought that? I'm sorry, I told you the story was going to be complicated. Now, Garinti sold cocaine, and his main supplier was a maid man with the Italian mob named Marlino. And Marlino had a crew of roughly five guys that he would do work with. So if Donati is tied to it, then Garinti must be tied to it. Therefore, Marlino and his gang could be tied to it. So when they start looking into the gang, they find a lot more tangible leads. For instance, the sister of one of the gang members claimed that she was helping him hang some art in his apartment and later identified it as one of the pieces stolen from the gardener. But they go to ask him about it. He's dead. He dies from a cocaine overdose. Or another member was seen on a surveillance report pulling an old Chinese vase from his car. So they have plenty of leads, but not enough to convict anybody of anything. But a man who just gets out of prison comes forward and he's willing to be an informant because he just hates Marlino and one of his main accomplices by the name of Davy Turner. So he records a ton of conversations for the FBI, giving them enough evidence to tie them to at least planning painting heists. Not necessarily the gardener, but painting heists in general. When they are brought in, though, they refuse to talk at all. But with Marlino in jail, now the gang attempts to use their trick of the trade in trading paintings for freedom, and one of the members says he has a gardener painting, and he will trade it if they release Dave Turner from prison. However... That dude dies before he can get the deal done. They go to talk to his wife, and she says they traded all the paintings to another guy named Bob Gentile. And at this point, the whole FBI goes, who the hell is Bob Gentile? Well, he's a guy who lives in Connecticut. He isn't even on anybody's radar. However, when they go to investigate him, they learn he has ties to the mob as well. They tear his house apart, they find nothing. So they go to investigate the gang further, and they learn one of them is found dead in a trunk, supposedly killed by Dave Turner. They try to convince another member to turn informant. That guy gets killed by Dave Turner. So now, literally everybody tied to this crime is dead, except Dave Turner. And he gets put in jail for a long time, set to be released in 2033. However, he must have known something, because his sentence gets seven years taken off of it. And then in 2018, his sentence gets another seven years taken off of it. And he walks out of jail in 2019. Now at the age of 51, he's a free man. So it leaves us with the question, what did he tell them to get 14 years taken off his sentence? Some would say that if he didn't know where the paintings were, why wouldn't he have given them info sooner instead of sitting in jail for 21 years? 
Or did he give them just enough so he could walk out sooner and then go claim that $10 million reward himself? I mean, who really knows? These pieces of history are still missing to this day, and people have reported sightings from Canada to Dublin, Japan, Saudi Arabia, France, wherever, but nothing ever comes of it. The reward is still available, so if you know anything, go claim your $10 million. Maybe throw a few bucks to old Red Eye. But all in all, this series was fascinating. I was glued to my seat the entire time. I've talked about it for way too long, but I've said it before and I will say it again. Netflix has a very good formula for crime documentaries, and I for one cannot get enough of these. Please make sure to subscribe if you haven't, like the video, hit the bell, leave some comments. I love talking to you guys. We will see you next time, and until that moment, stay happy and stay healthy.